بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين In shallow I'll start the presentation about Islam and science. Um, as I said, I will be talking, inshallah, about the relationship between Islam and scientific research and what does Islam say about it. Um, the importance of knowing the limits of each field of knowledge, a branch of knowledge, and where and when to apply it. And the importance of scientific research in Islam for the Muslims themselves and for the for the world's population, and also uh, to try and use a few examples of the verses of the Quran that has talked about science and scientific facts, inshallah. It's up to you how you want to do it. You want to interrupt me as I'm doing the presentation, feel free. You can ask me about a particular point. At the end, there will be a summary, and inshallah, time for questions is asked. But if there's, a, if there's a point that you can't understand, stop me straight away and we'll go through it, inshallah. So, just a quick reminder about scientific steps and uh, how scientific research should start in uh, an organized way. It usually starts with a, a particular observation that generates a particular question and then you go and follow, up, follow that by doing some background research about that topic, about that observation, whether it's been explained before or this particular question has been answered before. And if not, you try and create uh, some form of a hypothesis uh, that you want to attest. You test the hypothesis uh, with some sort of an experiment. It has to be obviously uh, done, designed in a particular way that makes it scientific. Um, you get the data, you draw the conclusion, and you share the results. So generations could build up and accumulate knowledge rather than everyone in a couple of years having to do the same thing again and again. Uh, if you want something to be productive, you have to publish it, you have to share it with others so people can learn from our mistakes or from our findings. Well, let's go back a step behind now and just define science. And if you have a very quick look in the dictionary about what science is, obviously it will have more than one definition, depending on the context. Um, but overall, you can see from, the present, from, from these few examples is to do with the physical world. Okay, now I appreciate there's some there's a branch called social sciences, right? So human interaction, which is not necessarily physical, uh, but overall science tends to be applied to this natural world, to the to the uh, to the tangible world, to the to the world of, of physics and physical findings. Uh, and also I think it's worth that we go back and define Islam, what Islam is since this presentation is about Islam and science. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some Muslims can't come up with a, with, a, with a definition straight away, they have to think about it, and we assume that as Muslims, we, you know, we live Islam, we, we eat, breathe, talk Islam, so this should be second nature. Now, I appreciate some people will have a different, slightly different interpretation of what Islam is and how they define it, but this is, this is something I, I like to remind myself of because it, it gives me an overview of the journey. Uh, simple terms, religion, set of guidelines that takes you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, takes you towards perfection. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate source of all perfection. And for, for you to get there, you have to guide and you have to adjust uh, your relationship with the environment people around and, and through them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just become on, on this line the word, the, the word environment um, you'll find that there is a shared ground because Islam addresses the interaction with the environment with the physical, with the materialistic world then it has a major interaction with science because science does study this materialistic world so there's a shared ground, there's a shared area which is why there is definitely a link between Islam and science. Uh, just up to us how we, do, how we define it and how much we take it further. Uh, there's no doubt in the minds of Muslims and uh, those who read the Quran, study uh, Quran al-Kareem, that the Quran repeatedly encourages its members to what? 
to ponder around, to, to think about the creation, to think about the world, to examine the world, to try and reach some conclusions from this world, um, which is its form of, the, the, the form of interaction between mankind and the materialistic world. And in fact, in fact, uh, in reaching the conclusion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does exist, there are several methodologies. There is some abstract philosophical conclusions. You have you know, some certain basic ideas that you have to put in order to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. And it's very powerful. It has not changed for the last five, ten thousand years of human civilization because these ideas are concepts are abstract and nothing to do with time. Doesn't nothing to do with science, so people people like to use it. However, that philosophical uh, approach to the existence of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is somehow for some people a bit dry. It doesn't it doesn't bond to them, and some people have it have difficulty understanding it. So they don't like to use it, even though it's very strong. And I would recommend that every single Muslim that he or she goes through this philosophical argument and just basically master it. Because it's it's unchanged, it takes you through to the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's actually reached straight away, but not everyone can digest it, not everyone likes to bond to it because it's dry and abstract. However, the scientific method of reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to wander around the creation, to think about the creation, to try and reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through uh, the, 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 the conclusions of scientific research, more, be pe more people relate to it and they find it closer to them. They find it, you know, because it's talking about tangible objects around them the mountains and the rain and the cells and the atoms and everything, you know. So people bond to it and it touches their hearts instead of just abstract information about philosophy. So a lot of people prefer this, and in fact, I have to say. A lot of Muslims do this and they leave the philosophical argument, which inshallah, another program with Ahlul Bayt uh, Society of Mirrors will go through the philosophical arguments because you have to master them. Uh, the warning is that we should not be trapped in the creation. So the, the, the advice is, like said, the advice is, is, is to, to link with the environment, to link with the creation, to reach Allah's had that through the creation, but you have to be quite careful not to be trapped in this physical world. So they have to always bear that in mind. Uh, and these are just several verses that go to uh, encouragement to think about the creation. So we shall show them our signs until Now, Ayatina, our signs in the horizons, i.e. the creation, whatever is around you, and in their own souls. And obviously Muslim scholars have researched this bit in a very, in a very nice way to, to try and um, get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more by examining the one self, the one soul. But obviously we're more familiar with this. This is what scientific research is about. This is the encouragement, that you need to look at the horizons, look at the creation, and find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reach the conclusion that He is the truth, He is the reality. Pick up on this world. Reality. The reality is that He does exist. The reality is that He is the Lord. Right? And I will come to the deficiencies of modern science. One of them is this ignorance of, of what it really is the reality. So, another verse. Uh, this one is the last verse in Surah Al-Talaq. Divorce, chapter of divorce, chapter 65. I like this verse very much because it summarizes the whole of the creation or the aim of the creation, if you follow it clearly. Allahu alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawat. Now we know that the first samawat, the first level of, this, of these heavens is this universe. Right? And the rest is beyond our, it's another dimension, as far as we can conclude. Saba'a uh, samawat, wa'ina al-ardi mithlahun. So the whole creation, whatever is in the seven heavens, which includes, as you all know, angels live beyond our dimension. 
the whole of the creation that lives within this dimension for one one particular point, for one aim and one aim only that you may know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. This whole thing is just a a, a a demonstration of what he's able to and what is he. Right? He's obviously beyond the dimension of the physical world, but the whole creation, this whole ecosystem that we learnt about in biology, in A levels. I mean I hope you still keep in touch with biology because it's very interesting and it keeps you keeps you motivated. Um, this whole thing, this human creation, this our interaction, our development, uh, the balance on a molecular level, it's also that you may know that Allah has power over all things. And this obviously, you don't know what Allah is, but you know His, his attributes. So a beautiful verse, summarizes the whole of the creation and the aims. So let's move on. So we say, fine, so the Muslims are saying that, you know, we love science and we encourage science, so we reach the Lord. So it's all about spirituality, isn't it? So it's all just, you know, you wait for scientists to find, re to, to do research, and then you just collect the result, and you sit at home and you ponder, oh, this is amazing, they've discovered it. It's not actually all spiritual, no. It's through searching the world, through scientific research, yes, you are reached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in itself, it will lead to development. We are not detached from this world. We don't, you know, we don't just hide in a corner and pretend that we are all about spirituality and let them deal with building and development and, you know, engineering and medicine and, and, and whatever it is and we'll just stick to the mosque and stick our to ten nights and, and blah, blah, blah. It's not like that. In fact, the prophets themselves have made a direct link between the relationship between mankind and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the development and the well-being of their societies. This is Nuh alayhi salam talking to his nation. And he's telling them that I, I, I'm advising you to seek for forgiveness and the direct link of that is that you will have more of this world. There'll be more, obviously, at their time, this is talking probably about 5000 BC, right? So their aim was what? Agriculture and just uh, limited development. So he was promising them that uh, if you do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help your society, your state, your village to develop. There will be more rain, there will be more gardens, more agriculture, more development if you bond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not all spiritual. And another verse, this is Hud alayhi salam. Hud alayhi salam again promises people that if you, if you link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you obey, if you submit to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be a direct result on you. You'll have more rain, your societies, your, 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 your development will go even further, and you, it will add strength to your strength. Okay, so it's not all spiritual, it's about development as well. Science, our, the, uh, let's say not our uh, attachment to science, I don't think we are so efficient, but Islam, what well, Islam promotes is both the spiritual side and the human development side with promoting science. Now, what are the problems with modern science? As I've alluded previously, a few minutes ago, it's actually detached from reality. Well, we say, well, how could that be? Science is about studying the reality. It is studying about, it is about studying the atoms and the human cell and the immune system and the solar system. So, why is this detached from reality? Because reality is, this world has a physical side and a, something beyond matter. People label it as metaphysics, i.e. the existence beyond the materialistic, beyond the, the three-dimensional the three objects around you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does exist. So if you want to study this world, ig ignoring the fact that there is someone here who exists and who controls and you try to pretend it's all in the lab, it's all I see in the microscope, and it's all what I do in the hospital, or in that lab, then you are actually detached from reality. Because reality should be, I want to know what the whole of the existence. And the existence is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He has created the materialistic world. 
So that is one of the main problems with modern science. It's actually detached from the true reality. Now how do we prove there's a true reality? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beyond the scope of today's discussion, but inshallah in future events we'll be able to discuss it. Another problem, because there is a general, this is not just anti-Islam, this is anti-religion, there's a general trend among scientists, unfortunately because of the, ch the way the church dealt with scientists a few centuries ago, there's this sentiment of anti-religion, anti-holy books, anti them in everything, including the beautiful, shared, humanitarian set of values, set of moral values. Now, I'd love for scientists to adhere to the shared values of all religions, but unfortunately there's this idea that, no, 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 keep religion, in fact, they would love to remove it from existence, but we'll just keep it where it is, church, mosque, temple, let's just do it our way, which is, it's all about what we see, it's all about what we can measure, and it's all about scientific findings. The problem with that is, you will always be faced with ethical questions, and in medicine, being a doctor, practicing doctor, I can tell you, in medicine, when they teach us about ethics, they don't give us a straight answer. It's always, you have to, this, this, is, this is kind of the, um, the statement of ethics in medicine, as far as I'm concerned, is you have to always um, understand, appreciate both sides of the argument, and you have to explain to the patient but actually, you can't decide because you don't know what's right and wrong. No one knows what's right and wrong. Do you abort the child? Is this really acceptable? No one knows. You can explain one side of the argument, say this is a human life, and you have to respect it, you have to do what it and the other side is, it's her choice, uh, she's the woman, whatever, and, and so on, right? So whenever there's a, an ethical dilemma, do you, do you, you, know, do you create the super baby from, from test tubes and fertilized embryos in the lab and you manipulate their genes and you create a, a human being based on your selection or other than the natural process? We don't know. You just have to explore both sides of the argument and just sit on the fence and wait. Wait for uh, some lobbying groups, wait for, for, for society to choose one way or the other and so on. But there is no right or wrong answer and that's a big problem. Because in the lab, there is no moral values. They don't, you know, you can't study moral values. They have to come from what's beyond, from metaphysics. So you need religion. And if you practice science without any moral values, then it's a really it's a disaster, and it can lead to disaster. And at the moment, believe it or not, we are living in a in a time where disasters keep happening because of lack of moral values, because of scientific research advancing without having a set of backbone of moral values with it. And this is not just to do with medicine only. Uh, you know, the, 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 the nuclear bombs that were dropped on, on Japan were done with a justification, right? There was justification for it. You know, it's science, scientific advancement, led to having a, a superpower, you can use it whenever you want. And you know, we differ about it. You say it wasn't applicable, they say it was applicable. You say it wasn't justified, they haven't apologized yet, have they? Have they apologized from, from, from dropping two nuclear bombs on a nation that was fighting for whatever reason? And the same thing, the, uh, I think it took the Japanese a few decades to apologize from some of their crimes that they did in China, and so on, right? So, it's a problem. No one knows what the right answer is, but just carry on and, and do it and then apologize. Well, some people don't even want to apologize. So. <coughs> let's, let's, let's give you just a, uh, in case you think I'm talking about Japan and it's all about 70 years ago and you're not bonding too, too much. Let's talk to you about a, a current issue, a modern problem. So, what's the explanation of our existence? This is, this is when science moves ahead through research, through findings, detached from reality, detached from the set of moral values and, and principles that religions teach. So if I ask an average A-level student or university student, tell me scientifically, 
since you are so amazed about science that you're taking it almost as an ideology, and that's a, da it's a dangerous thing to do. What is the explanation of my existence and your existence? You will say it's a process of several million years of, of uh, different organisms trying to uh, compete for survival. They started as single cells. Through chance they became multicellular and organisms and, and, and so on and so on. And today it's been a couple of millions of years, but the principle is the same. Because the scientific explanation of our existence is the same. That is, it's a collection of organisms trying to compete between themselves which leads to some environmental pressure or environment change so you need the fittest to survive and leads to evolution because if there's a population of 100 only the fittest will survive when the environment change and you can, you, can, you can see where this is going so if I say to you if it's a group of 100 organisms and some of us are are, are ill L not because of, of, of the environment, L just inherently, you know, we were born with genetic defects that we can't catch up with everybody else. Based upon this, is it best, what's, what's, what's the best option for these weak organisms within the population? To carry them with you, carrying the bad genes which will keep being passed from one generation or the other, or other, get rid of them, or allow them to pass away. Now, based upon this, we have, we have limited resources, right? Limited food back in the days, now we have limited money. If I ask you, why do we spend millions and millions and millions of pounds for medical research for children to help them to grow up to be adults, and we, and we knew right from the beginning they had problems with their genes. We invested millions to keep them alive. Shouldn't we just say, just drop them, let them go, and invest the millions in you know, increasing our strength and, and, and finding more resources and, and, and other aspects that will make us stronger because these guys can't catch up with us. If they breed, based upon this, if they breed, they will just bring up more weak genes. So if you have limited resources, if you're on a planet purely on materialistic ground, is it worth investing in keeping them alive? Of course not. It sounds very harsh, you know, coming from a doctor. But uh, that's the reality, if you want to take this as ideology for life. That's what we need to wake up to. <laughs> that is pure, you know, it's a pure gain. If it's about competition, drop the weak ones. You can say, well, no, actually, we've evolved now to treat our ill ones. I'm not talking about people that get ill as they progress. Fine, if you want to say, I want to increase the survival of certain people, but they just fall ill. Fine. I'm talking about those who are born with weakness. I'm being very specific about the example. I'm not talking about treating everyone with a chest infection or someone who developed cancer. You can, t you can twist this and say to me, it's a form of adaptation that we have medicines to treat the cancer. So when people reach their 50s and 70s, 60s, we prolong their survival. I'm talking about those right from the beginning we're weak. It's quite dangerous, by the way. And if we carry on like this, you probably say, "Oh, no way!" You know, not even atheists, not not a single doctor we've heard of talking about in this particular way. But I can tell you, we are heading this way. Maybe not in the next 30 years, 40 years, but if we keep going like this, we will get here. Basically, obviously, the explanation of our existence and the explanation why we help each other is beyond scientific explanation. It's to do with love and justice and mercy. That is beyond me measurement in the materialistic world. I'll be talking about Islam and science. And before I move to the Quran and science, I'd like just to touch upon Muslims and science. Um, some Muslims, because a lot of the scientific research comes up with results that try to devalue religion, they try to attack religion. And you'll see it, if you read research papers and you read conclusions from scientific bodies, a lot of them try to hint in one way or the other that this is contradictory to what certain religions preach. So religious communities, and Muslims talking about it specifically, feel threatened by scientific research. You know, one, scientist, you know, one scientist goes to an experiment and says, 
this is this is the right way of doing things uh, between a husband and wife, and this is and contrary to what certain religions teach. So the religious community straight away become defensive. And they start wrongly attacking science and devaluing it. And uh, taking a stance which is almost anti-science. Obviously it's unacceptable. Um, and some Muslims they get too confident about their holy book that they actually, whenever a scientific research comes up and gets published in Germany or Canada, they say, "Ah, oh, my brother, it's all in the Quran." He mentioned this. This is what he found. This is when he found it, 2009. The Quran mentioned it, brother. Just devalued. Fair enough, bro. So the Quran mentioned it, but he didn't know about it until this guy from Canada did the research and found it. So there's no point of being eager, sorry, arrogant about your holy book because you have nothing to do with it. By the way, he didn't do any research to explore the Qur'an, he did the research and yes, alhamdulillah, by coincidence his, his findings are consistent with some of the facts in the Qur'an so there's no point to taking the stance of oh yeah, yeah it's all in the Qur'an as Allah mentioned it fine, so you have to appreciate the scientists and say thank you very much did you know that you know, what, what you found through decades and centuries of accumulation of knowledge has been mentioned in a book 14 centuries ago and we think this is an evidence of superiority of this book, not superiority as taken as a replacement of scientific research, but no, superiority to human ability to produce this. This is the main conclusion that needs to come out of these findings. And I will explain this point even further as I go along. But don't just devalue science because it's been mentioned in the Quran. So the Quran. Quran is not a book for scientific findings. It's not a book for chemistry and physics. This is what we need to appreciate. Right? It's not Allah Subhanahu wa Taala not revealed the Quran as a substitute for human development, for people to go on and do dentistry and physics and economics and, and social sciences and all, to go and do their own research and then come up with the results. Maybe when they come up with the results of their own research, yes, it's very nice if they project that into the religion and see, this is what we found. Is there anything consistent with this from the religion? This is the right approach. This is what Muhammad Baqar al-Sadr wanted to stimulate people to think about. You go and you do your own research, then you come to the Quran and the Sunnah, of course. Quran and Sunnah. Well, evidence-based so, right? Not any so. Evidence-based so. It's not enough just to mention arts in a book and a page. You have to really research the chain of narration. So, you go and you do your human research, then you come back to the religion, and you, then you explore your findings and you compare it. Is there something to support it? Then I'm very confident about it. Nothing mentioned about it? Fine, I'll keep going. That's the right way. It's not to say, let's sit down, Read the Quran and try and find some solutions for some problems in chemistry or biology. No, Allah SWT did not send this book. It's, he sent it as a book of guidance. Guidance for mankind. For the, how to deal with the Quran and the Sunnah. But the religion of Islam, the book of Islam Sallallahu did not come up with a religion to replace, to substitute scientific development. The main point that I will explore in a minute behind finding scientific facts in the Quran is to prove this line. And in my limit, with my limited knowledge, this line will All we're trying to, to say is if scientific research in the 21st century has found this, and if this book was revealed 14 centuries to an illiterate man, then how do you explain? that the scientific findings, some of them, are found within this holy book. What is the explanation? Explanation, the only explanation is, he couldn't have done it because this conclusion in the 21st century is a result of accumulation of many centuries of experiments. So he couldn't have done it. He couldn't read, I mean, there's, there's even some sort of scientific heritage to help him to find these details. So the only explanation is, he wrote this book, he wrote this book, 
or the source of this book is someone beyond the human ability. That's what we're trying to prove. And that's what we're also saying, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator who is beyond time, has left a few glimpses of, 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 of light about some facts about the creation within his holy book. So when people reach them through scientific research, they what? They realize that this book that was worked by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was not his own. He did not make it up. He wasn't taught this by anyone. It's all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the source of the book and obviously the source of the creation. So now to an interesting part which I'll have to keep you more awake. Depending on the time, I'll go through some verses and if you're tired, stop me at any point, right? I will just examine with you some of the facts, some of the scientific facts that were mentioned in this holy book 14 centuries ago and we only found them in the 18th, 19th, 20th and 21st century. This is not to obviously to belittle the scientific research, this is just to make us familiar with the evidence that this book is beyond human, the human ability to produce this. And to be honest with you, it should help Muslims living in the West to present their holy book to non-Muslims. Because if you tell an average English uh, university student, oh, this book is amazing, and the level of Arabic was revealed in is beyond the ability of the Arabs 14 centuries ago, I'm sure he'll shake his head and say, hmm, that's very interesting. But how do you prove to, how do you prove to me today that this is the holy book? What do you say to him? You say, no, brother, you challenged the Arabs of the 14th century, and they couldn't come up with anything and say, well, I don't speak Arabic, I speak English and French. So how do you convince me that this book is a holy book? Well, brother, it's very nice, it talks about marriage and family unity and social justice. Fine. I can take that probably from other resources. Why do you say this book was not wrote by Muhammad on his own? Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He received it as a revelation. How do you prove to me? And my limited knowledge, the only way you prove to me is to say, well, how about this? When did people realize that actually the sun itself moves? And everyone will say, actually, prior to Galileo's cry, everyone believed that the sun moves. So this is, doesn't count. Fine. So up to Galileo's time, everyone believed that the sun moves. Fine. We'll come up to the how the earth moves. But then after Galileo, everyone thought, that's it. The sun is static, and it's the earth that goes around. And that went on for a couple of decades, probably even two centuries almost. And people thought, that's it. Galileo proved that the sun is fixed, it's static, and what you see around you is, a, is an illusion, because it's the earth that's going around it. Fine. Well, this is the Qur'an. And this is what I meant by a bit, you know, imagine yourself living during Galileo's time. When you have the Qur'an and science says, no, the sun is static. And you come up and say, actually, it says that the, the, the sun moves. So, what do you do then? You just have to say, well, in my holy book it says it moves, but keep researching. That's all you, imagine if you're living during Galileo's time, just, just after him, right? Scientific research says we've now, you know, we've, we've now destroyed the illusion that says, you know, the, the, the sun goes around the earth. It's actually the, the other way around. And imagine yourself as a Muslim reading this verse. What would you say to scientists? You will say, keep going. I'm not going to challenge you using the Quran. All I'm going to say is, in my holy book, this is what it says. Keep going with your research. Let's find out. Let's be a bit patient. And that's what happened. We were a bit patient, and clearly in chapter 21, <coughs> it's mentioned that the sun and the, and the moon, they travel in their orbits. Another mention of, 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 this, of this fact, in chapter 13, another scientific fact, but we'll, we'll just uh, move on. 
كُلٌّ يَجْرِي لِأَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Another fact, scientific fact, to say that both the sun and the moon, they actually travel uh, it says here to an appointment to, to an appointed time the Ajal al Musamma. We'll leave it there. The Ajal al Musamma for an appointed time. Fine? So there's a there's a point that they actually they are meant to stop. There's a time or a place they are meant to reach so they, they, they can stop. Another scientific fact that we're not trying to challenge science with, all we're going to say is what have you, what have you reached through scientific research? And it's, it's here in the Quran. Ah, this is, this is the one that I wanted to, to point out. So that one was talking about the time, this one talks about a place, a point that the sun has to stop at. The sun runs to a term. Now, and this is this is Shaka's uh, translation. It says a term. Now, term to me gives gives the indication it's time. Actually, here let's talk about a place. The mustaqar in So, a place, a point, or even a time that it will come to a static condition, status that it will stop there. Which is the beauty. One one of the one of the signs of the Quran being being from a holy source, from a source beyond mankind. This is a beautiful section from chapter 27. Now I want you to read this for a minute, then I'll go through the tafsir on it, because it's a bit tricky. I haven't written what the scientific fact is. You can see, because I want you to read it. There are several learning points here. Yeah? Are we finished? Then? Okay. Just a general question. Four verses. Your impression. What is it talking about? A particular event? Sorry? Yom al Qiyamah. The day of judgment. Right? Sorry? No, but yeah, of course, I mean, the, the top is talking about something else, right? But here, وَيَوْمَ Okay? And then there's change and destruction, and then it says here again, وَهُمْ مِنْ فَزِعَ يَوْمَئِذٍ آمِنُونَ And they shall be secure from the terror of the day. Of that day, actually. يَوْمَئِذٍ It's a particular day. So, at least these three appear to be talking about يَوْمُ Yeah? If you're not happy, I can go through the Arabic and explain it. You all happy talking about Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Actually, again, not all of it. I think the first, the first ayah, the one that's here that you left out, is the most significant in terms of scientific knowledge. In terms yeah. Of the human interaction with the, the day and the night. The day and the night, of course. Yeah, of course. Actually, I want to concentrate on this one. You're right. But I want to concentrate on this one. This is a beautiful example of a, a trend in the Quran. A lot of Muslims are familiar with it. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is infinite wisdom. Don't ask me why. Well, there is, there is an explanation, but this is an evidence of this phenomenon. Just remember it. Sometimes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His wisdom, He hides particular verses with, within a paragraph, a section that is completely, completely unrelated to it. At all. Are you familiar with this phenomenon? Like for example, Surah Al-Ma'idah, when it talks about the last, the day that the Prophet Sallallahu was ordered in Yawm al-Ghadir to announce Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? Where is it found? 
It's found within a, a verse. The beginning of it talks about food. The middle of it talks about... Jews and Christians. Sorry? Do you not take the Jews and Christians as your friends? This is afterwards, but this particular verse. The, the, there's one verse. It starts about food. middle is about... Ya ayyuhar rasul ballad ma unzi ilayka wa rabbik. To, and then continue to talk about food. This is a similar phenomena here. Quite similar. Just to prove that when we say there is a phenomenon that one is a trend, we're not just making it up for that particular verse. It could be people say, yes, yes, yes. You want to say this because it's, you know, it talks about something you like to prove that Ali ibn Talib this verse is talking about here. But look carefully. This is another evidence of this phenomenon. So, this one clearly talks about Yawm al right? This one clearly talks about Yawm al So why this isn't talking about Yawm al Or well, for the following reasons. Number one, you can get a feeling that when Allah subhanahu wa talks about Sun'ullah al-ladhi atqana kulla shayi innaw khabirun bima taf'alun So, it talks about the beauty of the creation how well it is organized, how well it is done. And usually in the Qur'an, this sort of expression is not associated with the Yawm Qiyam. Because we all know what's going to happen in Yawm Qiyam, everything will change. So Yawm Qiyam is usually about the day everything will change. Things will be destroyed. Things, yeah? You're familiar with this trend, especially if you read the last juzo of the Qur'an? And so on, it's, it's, it's obvious. So this is the first hint that tells you actually this is not talking about Yom Al-Qiyam because it talks about the beauty of the creation. This is exactly like this verse. Right? It talks about just generally the creation. Well, you can tell well, what about the mountains? Why did I underline the mountains? For a significant difference between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here in the mountains, about them, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the mountains and what will happen to them in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Do you remember the verses that talk about the mountains in Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Surah Al-Qa'ah, yeah? Al-Qa'ah, I'll give you a little bit of a question. Al-Qa'ah, I'll give you a little bit of a question. Al-Qa'ah, wa ma adraka ma al-Qa'ah, yawm yakun al-nasu kal-farashi al-manthu. You need to remember these verses, brothers and sisters. The Qur'an is in the heart. I know it's difficult, Arabic is in first language and all that, but you need to really make an effort. Since you're all young, alhamdulillah, and still students to, to, to remember these verses. They will help you in your life. It, it will mix with your flesh and bone. It will help to guide you, inshaAllah. يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَنْفُوثِ وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالِ كَالْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Mountains will be like... like Loose, like a loosened wall, you know, soof. You know how it feels? It will destroy you. Things will be destroyed. Right? This is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here. Right? The mountains. Yes, الجبال قل ينصفها ربي نسفا They ask you about the mountains. They ask you and talk. When you talk about Yawm Al-Qiyam, what's going to happen? You say Allah will destroy them, that Allah will destroy the mountains because they seem to be huge and, you know, there. It, he will leave them as a, as, a, as a smooth surface. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, if you pay attention, is talking about that you think. Now this is, the, by the way, this is the translation in the Qur'an, but I actually think it means still. You look at the mountains and you think they are still, not solid. Jamida is a literal translation, but Jamida it's not moving. You look at the mountains and you think they are still. And actually the mountains are moving like the clouds are moving. So this is so this the last bit of the verse gives a hint that's not talking about Yom Qiyamah. The description of the mountains is inconsistent with the previous descriptions of the Qur'an about Yawm Qiyamah. The last conclusion is, this verse is not talking about Yawm Qiyamah, and it's embedded between two verses that talk about Yawm Qiyamah. So it's an evidence of this phenomenon. But anyway, in today's talk, we're talking about Islam and science. What do you think the scientific finding of this verse is? 
وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ The mountains are moving like the clouds are moving. You're, you're actually standing on Earth, right? Rotation. Sorry? Rotation of the Earth, perhaps. Rotation of the Earth, or the movement of the whole Earth. If you zoom out, if you walk, if you, if you go to the outer space and you look at the mountains, what are they doing? It's either rotational movement or the whole movement, they're actually moving. It's both. Sorry? It's, it's translation and rotation of both. Exactly. Straight and spinning. Out. Exactly. So, you, you know, you're standing on Earth, 14 centuries ago, we think, you look at the, you know, say, well, actually, they're static, they're still. But the Quran says, no, they're not. They're actually moving, like the clouds are moving. So, this verse talks about either the rotational movement of the earth or the movement of the whole earth in an orbit. Again, 14 centuries ago. I might have spent a bit more time explaining this, but I found it very, very enlightening to, to examine it in any context. Shall I go a bit more, or should I? Oh, what time I started? Okay, this is slightly, in my opinion, a bit ambiguous. This talks about the wind. Now, Muslims say, the wind serves as, they carry the pollen, which I accept as a scientific fact. Again, 14 centuries ago, before uh, anyone knew about fertilization and that the wind can carry it and all that. But also I'd like to highlight to you not to jump to good conclusions. This is the danger that some Muslim scientists are doing. They find a verse, they make themselves familiar with it and say, that's it, it's a scientific fact in the Quran. Oh, just you slow down a bit. Slow down. This verse, actually this Lawat might be talking about rain rather than pollination. The process of making the rain here, how the wind actually carry the humidity up, you know, as it's as, as some form of fertilization of taking, if you want to say, the seeds to the environment, to the right environment, well, the, well, the, uh, uh, away from the surface of the earth, where there's enough temperature for the, to be precipitation and the rainfall. So, I'm not saying this is exactly what it is, but I'm saying it's possible. So, let's not jump into conclusions. Are you familiar why did I say the two possible explanations? Yeah. Because the verse clearly, it's linking wind to rain so but a lot of you know when I was told this in Iraq I was told this is talk this is talking about pollination right scientific fact you have to be careful of it not everything you know just you just don't find you don't just find a, a verse and say so the Quran I'll make a website about it just be careful just be careful choose something that's been established and been examined well before you make it because you risk if this is wrong if this is wrong and people will attack your religion and say, you've said this in 2011, look what it is now. Take a positive stance. Say, this verse is mentioned, maybe this is what it means. Go on, scientists, do, do your bit. Encourage it. Hopefully, Muslim scientists and Muslim scientists. <coughs> I expect you to be very familiar with this, with the order of it. Now, a man 14 centuries couldn't have known, Muhammad couldn't have known that actually the bones are created first, then muscles are attached to the surface of it. How could you come up with this word? Now notice in English, again this is a point about English. Here it's flesh, here it's flesh. I'll put this in brackets. Because mudra is a lump of flesh. Lahman here talks about muscle. So again, when you read the Quran in English, you have to be careful, you know. This may not be uh, quite accurate. You, you know, if you, if you, if you, let's say you didn't have this muscle here, and you're reading the respected work of many Muslim mufassirin, right? You say, well, what is this? A lump of flesh, then uh, 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 bones, then flesh. Why, why is flesh mentioned twice? This is not appropriate. Well, actually, in Arabic, it's not mentioned twice. It's completely different. Two different things. But so just inshallah, this will stimulate you to learn more about Arabic. I think I'm coming to the end. Yes, the end. So the summary, brothers and sisters. Um, Islam and science. Definition of Islam this is the path towards perfection. From guiding us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our relationship with everything around us. 
mankind, environment, and taking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam supports scientific research, it encourages it. Clearly in the Quran, go and think about the world, go and examine the world. And it's not just purely for a spiritual gain, but for human development as well. It will have a positive impact on our development, on the way we plan our cities, address poverty, and find more medicines, and so on. Um, remember that the danger of modern science, when it's detached from reality, that is the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the super being, metaphysics, it's dangerous because it leaves you thinking that I could deduce, I could make all the conclusions about life from science. And I've just shared with you one example of potentially that a couple of centuries, if we keep going like this, inshallah, it's like a couple of centuries, maybe a couple of decades, people will come and say, let's not invest, especially in the current financial climate, let's not invest in treating weak individuals in humanity. Let's just let them go, save this money for something else. Purely on the of the ground, purely. And remember that the Quran al Karim did not come to substitute scientific research. Don't use it to fight against science and say, well, this is in the, this is in the Quran, you know, um, I can show you more facts from the Quran because the Quran is a book that has information about everything. This is not a literal thing, it's, a, it's everything that you need to live. Now, you could live, you could live. 5000 BC and you could live in the year 2011, right? The Quran will carry, will carry answers for you to live. It doesn't matter whether you are you have airplanes and internet or simple farm and agriculture. The Quran will guide you throughout time because it's talking about things that you need to continue to live. But it doesn't matter what your interaction is, it doesn't matter what science around you is like. The only conclusion we're trying to prove is that Quran, the source of it, is not man-made. And this will lead us to this conclusion. If you leave this presentation with nothing apart from this one conclusion, then I'm happy. All we're trying to say is, for a scientist to come up to me in 2011 and say to me, Look, we've studied social sciences, we've studied medicine, and we think, you know, women should have not equal rights, should have exact positions in society as men. This is the result of decades of research. Not, not I'm very, very careful to say equal. We believe in equal rights, but Equal doesn't mean similar, right? You have to adjust it. I say to him, look, what you're doing is a result of, fine, a couple of centuries of research. I have a source that has proven to be superior to you. I'm not challenging you about scientific research. But the facts in the Quran, in the Sunnah, in Islam, is superior to your facts. If you're going to come and challenge me. Is this clear? Right? I went, I think I was a discussion group in France, and an educated member of society said to me, so what's the plan now with the recent change in Iraq? Are you going to allow women to be judges? I said, why do you say that they should be judges? He said, because it's about equality. I said, according to what? He said, well, you know, the Human Rights, 1948, I said, wait a minute. The Human Rights Convention was written in 1948. I have a document of human rights that was written in the 7th century. Okay, not in the 20th century. So actually, you're trying to catch up with my rights and values because, sorry, not mine, the last part of the Alice guidance. You're trying to catch up with it. Not the other way around. So the whole, this whole presentation to say that we encourage science and we have scientific facts in the Quran and we're proud of them and it just shows that the Quran is superior is to come to this conclusion. That I will not be shaken with a medical or social sciences conclusion in the 21st century if it contradicts my religion. 
I will not be shaken. I, will, you know, I won't be tricked by saying, look, it's evidence-based, we study these societies, this is what I say, no, it's not. You want to try? Go and try. I will stick to something that has been tried and tested for 14 centuries. I will stick to this. Say, no, you don't need marriage. Research says you don't need marriage. I said, no, you do need marriage. Because of this. I'm not going to waste the lifetime of generations trying to examine whether you know, man and, and woman can have a relationship. And can, can, the question is, can man and woman have a stable relationship with, to bring up future generations without marriage? Do you want to try? Do you want to subject people to both po poverty and lack of education? Do you want to try? I don't want to try. I just want to take, take it from a trusted source. You try. And you bring me your results in three, three centuries. The results are going up much sooner. Right? Starting in the 60s, today we have living examples of how bad that model was. You tried for 50 years, 60 years, look how many lives have been lost. I don't say we try, so we should just stick to the original. But why do I say this is original? Because every time we look at this book, it's alive. Even with science, it's still alive. The sun and the moon and the, and the, the mountains and the embryology is still alive. Not to replace research, but it is superior. Hence, I will trust anything that comes with it. And I'm not going to try. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if I can answer them. Wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alayhi 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 wa ala alay